And thanks to all the organizers for letting me have this opportunity to, to talk here. Um, yeah, so the stuff I'm going to talk about today, it's um, there's a preprint posted um, from last month on archive. So um, if you if you want to hear any details, please um, uh, check it out and, and let me know. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of the details I haven't fit into um, the slides here. So um, hopefully that can be a useful resource. Um, so so to start the talk today, I just want to review first what a torsion point is. Um, so this is this is a definition that works for any abelian group, but for us, um, it's really only going to be some special cases. So we'll I'll just talk about those. So um, so the first example is if we take a circle, um, R mod C, uh, then the, so so let's say we choose identity at the top here, and the three torsion points um, look like uh, so they're just the angles where if you um, triple the angle, you get to identity. So you have um, three points in the three torsion subgroup, and, and then some of the other six points in the six torsion subgroups. And if we instead move on to a this uh, two-dimensional example, um, this two-dimensional real torus, um, now we have, so we have a single identity point here. Um, it uh, just shows up four times because of the gluing. Um, then there's, um, there's going to be four points in the two torsion subgroup and then three point, uh, nine points in the three torsion subgroup. Um, right, so this is just um, what our torsion subgroups look like. And as, as we take the whole torsion subgroup, we're taking a union over all possible n. So, um, right, and the examples we're gonna use in this talk are really just gonna be um, things that look like it's in higher dimensions. So we're always going to take the abelian group to be the Jacobian either of an algebraic curve or the Jacobian of a tropical curve. And in each of these cases, um, the group is just some uh, real torus of some dimension. And in particular, when we take the torsion subgroup um, in each of these cases, our torsion subgroup will always look like, um, like these rational points on a real torus. Um, okay, so that kind of covers this first item, what, what kind of torsion points we're talking about here. Um, okay, and, and so the this Jacobian stuff, I'll, I'll say a bit later about what, what I mean that by that. Um, okay, so the second thing I want to cover is, um, before getting into the tropical stuff, is why do people, um, why should we sort of care about torsion points to begin with? Um, so the motivation I want to start with is um, coming from uh, number theory, um, which is where, where you try to count rational points on varieties. Um, so kind of a big initial um, push in this direction was um, counting rational points on the specific Vermont curve. So if um, I guess Vermont claimed to maybe have this as a theorem or not as a conjecture, but um, when um, he studied this specific curve, um, he seemed to think there were not very many solutions. So in particular, he, he said something much stronger than finitely many. He said there's only the trivial solution. So basically when you have these to be zeros and ones, um, so this, this was claimed a long time ago for Fermat, but it took a really long time for it to be actually solved. Um, but a lot of, um, I guess a lot of nice mathematics came out of this, um, try, trying to solve this problem. And it was also uh, realized um, in the last century that there's this nice generalization. Um, so this big, um, so now a big, a big conjecture within arithmetic geometry was that if you we can generalize the specific family of curves, to just any curve of genus two or higher. Um, and, and I guess also there should be some additional niceness assumptions like smooth curves, but I'll just um, not, not leave those details here. Um, so this um, generalization said, if you have a, this curve of genus at least two, it also has finitely many rational points. And um, this also took a fairly long time to prove, but, but it was eventually proved as well. Um, but there's also, an additional strengthening event that's, that's still not known. So um, what's not known, but suspected to be true is that not only can we uh, have uh, know that the number of rational points is finite, but it's suspected that we can bound the number of rational points by some number that only depends on the genus. Um, okay, so this is a big problem that, that mathematicians are still trying to um, figure out. Um, so this is, 
Um, right, to get from national points, so to tuition points, we can just work by analogy. So we had, um, right, so we, we saw earlier that for us, our torsion points are going to come from the Jacobian. And um, right, so we said this part is going to look like um, rational points inside a real torus. Um, so just like here, when we count rational points on a variety, we assume it has some uh, the variety has some embedding in affine and protective space, and we're just intersecting that with the rational points of that space. And um, just like we could, um, instead of embedding our variety into um, affine space, we could instead embed it in the Jacobian. So any algebraic curve has a natural um, embedding into its Jacobian variety up, up to choosing some base point um, to go from. So once we embed the Jacobian inside its variety, it's also, um, it kind of makes sense to try to think how it hits these rational points of the Jacobian instead. Um, okay, so much, much later than um, the Mordell conjecture was made, uh, Menin and Mumford conjectured that this analogous statement should hold for um, torsion points of the Jacobian as well. So if we intersect um, a curve, an algebraic curve of Gs and at least two, we look at how that um, curve intersects torsion points in the Jacobian, we only get finitely many. Um, and, and this was um, proved by Raynaud actually in, I guess, in the same year as um, the Mordell's conjecture was proved. Um, and then just after that though, there's still this analogous strengthening to try to show a uniform bound as well. So um, saying that the, this number of torsion points could be bounded by um, a function only depending on the genus. Um, so this was also, uh, until very recently, this was open, but as of about just one year ago, there were two preprints that came up on the archive um, pro proving this conjecture in, in separate cases. So with uh, Kuhn's uh, version, um, he proves this for uh, number fields, for curves over number fields, and then the work of Looper, Silverman, and Wilms um, proves the case when uh, the, the function field case. And um, right, so so I guess as the um, in the direction uh, the the um, right, so so perhaps the the, the results uh, the tropical results that that I've done here, um, I guess that maybe there's less hope to prove something new with it, but maybe we could prove a um, under understand for this uh, this result in some better way um, using more explicitly tropical results. And um, also, I guess just to mention in, in terms of how the work here is related to um, the work of um, th this, this recent work on the uniform minimum effort conjecture, um, it does, so, so from looking through the, these results somewhat briefly, Looper, Silverman, and Wilms does um, use some of the same tools um, such as um, potential theory on graphs, potential theory on mesh graphs, um, but I wasn't able to see any um, very strong connection with, um, I guess, the techniques I tried in, in their work as well. Um, so, so I guess that's something I would be interested in, in looking into details further. Um, okay, right, so to get closer to the, the direction I was looking at, um, I uh, there is another analogy that was applied, which is to replace algebraic curves by tropical curves instead. Um, so if we, if we look at just the rational points case, there's not really a tropical analog. There's not a nice tropical analog of looking at uh, rational points inside tropical affine space. But if we look at the Jacobian version, there is a nice tropical analog of Jacobians here. So it makes sense to just take the same two conjectures from before and um, just turn them directly into tropical statements. So we could we just take um, yeah instead of algebraic curves we take tropical curves, and um, the tropical Jacobian um, has been shown to to satisfy a lot of um, properties analogous to what you'd expect from algebraic curves. Um, so we could ask is the number of torsion points finite tropically, and uh, moreover could, could there be some uniform bound if it is finite. Um, so these are the the two questions I'm um, going to discuss and um, see what is or is not true here. 
Any questions up to here? Um, okay, so I, I think here is kind of the, I think after this, I, I get into some tropical geometry background. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay, all right, yeah, so to, so the objects um, I'll be talking about are tropical curves, which I'll think about as given by the following data. So I take a, I take G to be a finite connected graph. Um, and uh, this L is a length function on its edges. So each edge of the graph gets assigned some positive real length. And then I end up, and, and this object I really think of as a um, topological space with a metric on it, um, given by pass, uh, pass distance. So um, I guess some examples of tropical curves are, um, so we, we could take this tree, or we could uh, maybe our graph form some loops, um, like in these two cases. An important invariant we're going to assign to these graphs is the um, genus of the, of the graph or curve. Um, and uh, so the genus is just going to be defined to be the dimension of the first homology. Um, so the three examples here correspond to genus um, one, two, and three. Right, so, so for me, when I talk about tropical curves, I'll think of this as the same thing as a, a metric graph. Um, as described below. And to say a bit more about this, um, so I, I defined a graph as coming from this data. So the metric graph comes from a combinatorial graph and a length function. Um, I also want to think of some uh, equivalence relation among this. So if I, if I take, say, this graph with um, these seven vertices, I could also subdivide one edge into two sub edges by introducing a new vertex. And as long as the lengths add up correctly, I'm going to think of this as defining the same metric graph. So um, implicitly, I'll, I'll, I'll be thinking up to um, this kind of equivalence of subdividing or joining edges. Um, right, and the, the sketches here that I've drawn above are sort of analogous Riemann surfaces in, in each of the corresponding genuses. Um, so one, one way you might, be motivated to study tropical geometry if you come from an algebraic geometry background is um, by thinking of these as representing deformations of a Riemann surface. So if we take a Riemann surface and say shrink down certain um, loops on the surface, then what we're left with is going to be described somehow by, by a combinatorial graph like this. Um, okay, so now that we're um, okay, now that we're studying metric graphs, we could also um, it turns out we can um, apply divisor theory like we do on algebraic curves. Um, so um, the same the same way we have for an algebraic curve, we define divisors to just be a formal sum of points. And um, the motivation for this from from algebraic geometry, we're typically studying zero sets of polynomials, um, but it um, but the formalism is we just take some sum of points. So if these are the points x, y, and z on, on our metric graph, um, we can represent, we can take this formal sum and we'll just represent that graphically by, by drawing this dot along the graph. And um, when the multiplicity is higher than one, we can also add some number to indicate that. Uh, and otherwise, we'll assume the default multiplicity is one. Um, we're allowed to have positive or negative coefficients. Um, and um, right, but if all of, we don't have any negative coefficients, we say it's effective. And we also, an important, um, we define the degree of a divisor to just be the sum of the coefficients that show up. Um, okay, and for the so the quick definition of the Jacobian of the graph um, is we're going to define it as this uh, set of degree zero divisors. Um, up to a tropical linear equivalence relation. Um, right, so the divisors naturally form an abelian group um, just from the definition. Um, and the degree zero divisors form a um, subgroup of that. And then we'll, so, so next we'll, we'll spend a, a few minutes talking about what this 
tropical linear equivalence comes out to. Um, so in the algebraic case, this is tropical linear equivalence comes from saying when we take a ratio of polynomials, the zeros um, divisor of zero should be equivalent to the divisor of poles. Um, so we'll, what we're going to look at is, is what the appropriate tropical analog of this is. Um, so here we have, um, right, so we're going to approach this equivalence relation first by a, um, in two steps. So first there'll be a discrete case, which is we'll um, kind of forget about the length function, or in other words, we'll, we'll just assume all the lengths are one. And we'll look at a graph. Um, so now, now the only relevant data is a set of vertices and edges. And we can generate our equivalence relation by the following um, statements. So if we, um, so one type of move we can do is, um, so if we start with some divisor like the one given here, we can choose any vertex and choose to fire that vertex, which means we look at all of the edges incident to that vertex and we move one chip outwards. Um, so um, the, the pile of four, um, right, and I guess we're talking about the, um, so the, the divisor, this formal sum of points on our graph, we think of as chips being placed. Um, so we have positive chips um, on these two points and one negative chip up here. So when you fire this vertex, three of the chips move away from this point and we're left with just one. And then uh, the three chips move along these edges and increase um, these numbers by one on the new divisor. Um, so this is one. Um, so this is our outcome after firing uh, this bottom vertex. And one thing to note is that after applying this move, uh, the total number of chips or the degree stays unchanged. So here we have a degree four for, uh, divisor and afterwards we saw the degree four divisor. Um, okay, so it's, it's actually sufficient to only think of moves like this to generate our equivalence relation on a graph, but we'll, actually, we'll consider as a separate case um, that is uh, convenient as well. So in addition to just finding single vertices, we could just pick a whole subgraph um, some induced subgraph of G. So if we take our induced subgraph as both edges down here, we're going to look at um, the set of edges that go from the subgraph into its complement. So that consists of these three edges. And the firing move consists of um, subtracting one vertex from one side. So for each edge, we're going to move one chip from um, the side inside A and move it towards the side outside of the subset A. Um, so here. Here is my subset A. Um, so in this case, there's also three chips that end up moving. Um, but again, as before, the total degree remains the same. Um, so we have uh, this, this other type of move. Uh, these, these two divisors are defined to be in the same linear equivalence class. Um, Okay, so now to address the general case um, for metric graphs, we also have to introduce a continuous component. So what we're going to do here now is instead of only picking a subgraph, um, we're also going to introduce some positive number epsilon as part of the data of a, um, a firing move. So now if we say fire at this vertex, we're going to, like before, we're going to move three chips away from this vertex along the incident edges, but we're not going to move them all away. We can just move them some small distance epsilon. Um, but the uh, distance moved along all three edges has to be the same distance. Um, right, so one restriction is that our choice of epsilon shouldn't be so large that we kind of run into another vertex, um, but all, all sufficiently small epsilons are um, okay, are, are valid firing moves. Um, and we could also do this for um, larger subsets of the graph as well. Rather than a single vertex, we could take this whole bottom edge as our closed subgraph. And so firing away from there, we, we see there's three edges um, incident to this closed subset. So we're going to move one chip along each of these edges 
um, our chosen distance epsilon. Um, but also our, our subsets don't really have to end at vertices. We could try to end them arbitrarily at interiors of edges as well. Um, so in this case, now we, have, we still have three edges incident to this third closed subset, and we could move our chips along these three segments of the same length. Um, right, so in, in particular, since there's no chips here initially at the, at the boundary of the subset, we'll see after the firing move, we'll end up with a negative chip um, and one gets moved to the other side of this um, boundary. Um, okay, so this is, these are the set of moves that generate our linear equivalence relation in the tropical case. Um, you could also, uh, an, an, an equivalent way to describe this that see, sounds more analogous to our, um, the case of algebraic curves is we could um, consider these as taking, um, we could consider piecewise linear functions on our graph, which have slopes, um, integer value slopes. And we can consider this as taking the set of zeros and set of poles of, piece, of piecewise linear functions as well. Um, but this, um, I guess the, the version presented here is often more convenient for doing small calculations on graphs. Um, Okay, great. So now, now that we have linear equivalence, we have enough information to, to go back to the definition of the Jacobian. So um, to review, we are taking degree zero divisors and modding out by this equivalence relation we just defined. And um, the Jacobian also comes equipped with a way to embed our tropical curve into its Jacobian um, that works the same way as the algebraic case. So all we do here is we, um, we send each point on our graph we need to turn it into a degree zero divisor. So we just do that by subtracting off some uh, base point we fixed ahead of time. So our embedding depends on this um, base point, um, but many properties uh, will actually stay the same regardless of what base point we choose. Um, and uh, for us, so for this question of finiteness, we're going to, we're going to talk about some number being finite uh, depending on Q. So um, when we want something to be finite, uh, for the statements we're making, we want this statement to be true for all choices of Q. Um, right, so um, one, one nice thing about the Jacobian that's not really obvious from the definition I gave so far is that it turns out to just be a real torus. Um, and it's real torus whose dimension ends up agreeing with the genus of the underlying tropical curve. Um, so this was shown, this can be shown in a, in a manner that's also analogous to algebraic case. We can show um, a, a um, isomorphism from the set of Jacobian as we defined it using divisors, um, creating an isomorphism with the um, first uh, cohomology groups of, of this underlying topological space. And so, it, and it follows from this that when we look at the torsion subgroups, we again get to this um, space of rational points in a real torus. Okay, so we'll be studying um, in, for each metric graph, that'll come equipped with some embedding into a real torus as well. Um, and the interesting case for us will be when the this genus or the dimension of the Jacobian is at least two. Um, so to get a nice picture of what these Jacobians look like, we're gonna need one additional theorem, which um, uh, states the following. So um, not only is the Jacobian this um, nice real torus, but it's a real torus that decomposes into nice combinatorial pieces. So each, um, right, the divisor classes in the Jacobian um, can be cut up into nice pieces where each piece is indexed by a spanning tree of the graph. Um, right, and here, um, I guess the unique representative is us. Uh, here, the uniqueness is up to choosing a base point.
Um, and the other thing is that, um, all right, I, I guess, so to maybe see an example of how this works out for us, if we take um, this graph down here, the theta graph, so we have um, two vertices and three edges. Um, so this graph has just three spanning trees. To get a spanning tree, we just choose one of the three edges. And what the divisor classes in the Jacobian are broken up to, um, they, they fall into these three cases. So either um, the, right, so we want to look at a degree zero divisor and we can split that up into having uh, minus two at this fixed space point at the top and then two other points somewhere else on the graph. So the three cases are there either on uh, the left two edges or the right two edges or the um, far left and far right edges. And each of these cases ends up matching with one of the spanning trees. So the spanning tree will be in the complement of where the um, for this, this positive support of the divisor class um, right, So this is useful for understanding because this, um, right, we, we, we can break up this Jacobian into um, convenient combinatorial pieces. Um, so to, to draw a picture, so, so we said um, the pieces of the Jacobian are labeled by these three spanning trees, um, but we can also uh, draw a picture of this. Oh, right, yeah, so we have a union of cells. Um, right, the upshot is that we have the Jacobian can be um, written as cells indexed by spanning trees of our graph. Um, and, and what we're, I guess the statement is somehow um, mixing up the, the graph with this underlying data, the metric graph and the combinatorial graph. Um, so we could choose many different combinatorial graphs to represent the same graph, um, but this is still, um, I, I guess for this theorem to work, we were just choosing one um, out of convenience here. Right, so to go back to this data graph example, um, let's say we had this data graph, but now we're assigning the edge length so that one, the left edge is twice as long as the um, other two edges, let's say. Um, so we said we, from before, we have these three types of um, divisors, degree zero divisors, um, depending on where the positive part lies. And each of these will form a rectangle. So as we, as we vary, um, in the first case, if we vary these two, um, the position of these two chips, we have these two degrees of freedom. So that's gonna fill out a um, two-dimensional um, cell. So this uh, two-dimensional box shape. And um, right, these classes will not be distinct though. They'll be glued along certain edges. And that occurs when um, the chips, instead of being in the interior of the edge, the chips are still allowed to be on the um, at the vertices as well in between two edges. Um, so there's, I guess, here I've drawn out some um, exceptional pieces. So the boundaries. Um, so these will be the, um, right, the, what I've sketched out here are going to be the, um, what the divisors look like when we're in the interior of these three cells. And these three divisors will correspond to the three vertices inside this Jacobian. Um, so uh, maybe as an exercise though, um, I'll leave it as an exercise to figure out which of these divisors correspond to which um, of the vertices. Um, so combinatorially, we see that two of the vertices look the same locally. So this one and um, this one look the same. Um, but the third one looks different. So this one has kind of six two-dimensional faces adjacent to it rather than three. Um, so there is, there's kind of a choice of correct assignments or incorrect assignments here. Um, okay, so this kind of helps us. So using this um, break divisor theorem of on Baker, Cooper, Gerberg, and Shockery, we see that there's a we get a sort of better combinatorial understanding of what our Jacobian looks like. And we can now apply this to thinking about um, what elements are, are going to be torsion in our Jacobian. 
Um, right, so on the same metric graph, a convenient choice of degrees or divisors, we could just take the two trivalent points at the top and bottom and take their difference. Um, and then consider, mul consider multiples of this divisor. Um, so let's say we, if we chose our base point such that um, this vertex is the is um, our zero, um, then choosing the divisor x and y um, will match up to one of the other vertices. So we can think of going from zero to uh, this divisor d as going pa just parallel to this um, vertex, uh, this this vector. So if we double the divisor, um, so this point's equivalent to this one. So we'll end up here at the center point. If we add one more copy of the divisor, we'll end up here. Um, this is three times our divisor. And then um, if we continue adding, we'll see that when we take five times our divisor from looking at this um, picture, we'll, we'll see that we end up back at the origin. Okay, so this point was equivalent to um, zero according to this torus boundary Euclidean. Um, Okay, so we see that um, this divisor x minus y of the two vertices is a five torsion element. Um, this is something we could also check by um, this equivalence relation. So we, we said our, um, I guess what we're saying is that having minus five and plus five on the two vertices should be equivalent to having um, zero as well. Um, And as one slightly more general exercise, we could um, right, we could check that if we now modify the edge lengths to stay one, but um, the long edge changes to some integer n, then in this case, our the same divisor class would be torsion of degree two n plus one now. Um, and and so that's the case for a positive integer. If if instead this length is an irrational number. Um, we should be able to verify that this is a non-torsion element. And then the other cases, if it's some rational number um, with some denominator, um, it might be a bit trickier to calculate what the what the torsion order is, but it, but it will help some, it will be torsion of some order. Um, okay, so this is just illustrating one concrete example of, of looking at a tropical curve, looking at a specific divisor and um, seeing whether it is torsion or it's not torsion. Um, inside inside the Jacobian. Um, okay, so I, I think after this, I'm going to mention some. Oh, right. So so here we're going to observe though that um, so that some of the natural results we might expect from the algebraic case turn out to not be true in the tropical case um, for some um, sort of straightforward reasons. Um, so the first kind of negative result we'll see is that when we take a um, graph with unit unit edge length, so like this um, combinatorial case. Um, so first we could observe all vertices are torsion points. So this is assuming if we pick one of the ver vertices as our base point, then every other vertex will um, end up as a torsion point inside the Jacobian under able Jacobian embedding. So um, this was actually um, Right, so, so this is known as um, a fact about the critical group of the graph. Um, this was historically studied um, early, even earlier than, than this notion of uh, Jacobian of the metric graph version. So um, yeah, right, these vertex supported divisors always generate a finite group. And moreover, it has some nice combinatorial properties. So the number of elements in the critical group is the same as the number of spanning trees of our graph. Um, okay, so that, that observation gives us a large set of points that are torsion, but um, this doesn't tell us right away we have infinitely many. But to get infinitely many, all we have to do is uh, just subdivide all of the edges even. So if we take the same graph with unit edge lengths, we could say subdivide each edge in half, and then say double, double the lengths. And, and that's going to guarantee all of the new subdivided vertices um, or the, the midpoint vertices are in the same torsion class as well. 
And if we just repeat this process infinitely often, we'll see that there's an, um, we'll see that this uh, graph has infinitely many torsion points. Um, so, so right away from this observation, we see that this tropical uh, min and Mufford conjecture fails in the case of unit edge lengths at least. Um, but we can also say a bit more beyond just the case with unit edge lengths. Um, we could even replace this with um, rational edge lengths um, because in the rational case, uh, we just have finitely many edges. We could scale um, all the edges up to clear denominators and then um, turn that into an inter integer edge length graph. And as a metric graph, we could just sub subdivide each edge of integer length with um, um, into a, a finite number of unit edge lengths. So by just by rescaling and subdividing on a on any graph with rational edge lengths, we can turn it into this unit edge length case as well. Um, Okay, so there's um, so we see that in this large class of tropical uh, curves, the analogous the statement of the minion Mumford conjecture fails, uh, and we could also um, observe some variation of this. So um, not only does it fail in this global case where we're restricting all edges at once, we could um, think about having a single uh, a case where it fails due to a single edge. Um, so as long as a single edge contains two torsion points for some choice of metric graph, um, that's going to also cause the Manin Mufford conjecture to fail. So we have um, so so for this observation, all we have to realize is that this able Jacobi embedding in the tropical case is going to map map each edge into a straight line segment because it's going to act um, as an affine linear map. So if we if we say take this edge and we see there are two torsion points inside our Jacobian, um, that means that both of these points get sent to points inside um, these uh, the set of rational points. And that tells us that if we subdivide it, so take a point halfway in between, that's also going to be a rational point as well. And so we can, again, do this uh, process of infinite uh, subdivisions. And that will produce infinitely many torsion points along this um, given segment that we focus on. Um, right. So, so the second observation so it says we even have a local version of failure of this minion Mumford conjecture. Um, um, okay. So we could also try to spin this as a positive thing. Um, so in the other direction, we could think of this as saying, um, if we do know there are only finitely many torsion points on a tropical curve, then this observation gives us some strong restrictions on how many torsion points there are. Um, we're saying if there's finitely many torsion points, there can be at most one per edge. Um, okay, so this leads to sort of the first of the, the results about the tropical case. So this is, um, so the theorem says, assuming the number of torsion points is finite, we get a nice uniform bound um, right away. So what this bound comes from is just saying, we know there's going to be one torsion point per edge, and then we can easily count the number of edges as a function of the genus. Um, so this is, right, so this bound we get is just a number of, um, it's a bound on the number of edges in, in our graph. And um, right, and for this bound to hold, we do have to make some assumptions like there aren't, um, we remove any extra um, vertices. So if we had any degree of one vertices, we can shrink those down. And if there's any um, edges that are just subdivided by a degree two, Vertex, we can also get rid of those, but but those operations are not going to change properties of the Jacobian. Um, so so this bound holds in in an arbitrary metric graph as well. Um, okay, so that's one way to kind of spin, uh, I guess, spin a positive perspective on 
uh, despite despite the failure of this statement of holding full generality in the tropical case. Um, and one other variation we can say is that, um, right, so rather than just assuming that this is that this number is finite, we can we can also argue that it actually is finite for many metric graphs as well. Um, so we need we need these two additional assumptions though to um, get finiteness of torsion points. Um, okay, so this first condition by connected, uh, I didn't really discuss um, versions of, but essentially this is saying that even if our metric graph is genus three officially, like um, like this one, it really behaves as if it were um, two separate graphs. So even though we take a genus three metric graph, if we have a bridge edge here, so it separates into two pieces, it's going to behave in terms of torsion points, it's going to behave like a genus one graph on the side and a genus two graph on the other side. And the genus one piece will um, cause the number of torsion points to be infinite. Um, okay, so we, we do need to avoid cases like this um, by, by imposing this by connected condition. Um, right, and the second condition, the very general condition is the one that kind of avoids this case of having all rational edge lengths that I discussed earlier. Um, so it's, um, right, but, but the, the necessary condition is a bit um, stricter than only avoiding all rational edge lengths. Um, so, so to first describe what this condition means, um, the, the term I'm using very general, by that I just mean that I'm taking um, right, if I take a very general subset of Rn, that means I'm deleting a countable subset of um, positive co-dimension algebraic subsets. So these are um, subsets defined by vanishing of polynomials, and um, I want it to be vanishing of some non-zero polynomial for it to be a uh, for it to end up being positive co-dimension. So um, one example of doing this is we can just um, take out all points where a single vertex, a single coordinate is a rational number that defines countably many conditions we're getting rid of. But we could also do something stronger where not only do we want a single coordinate to be non-rational, we could say just for any, for any rational polynomial, um, we want the evaluation to be non-zero. Um, so this is getting rid of all rational points, but also getting rid of uh, much more. Um, but we're still left over with, um, I guess, lots of very irrational points in our subset. Um, so the way we're, we're applying it here is the um, our choice of edge lengths. We could parameterize this by um, a space that's, that just looks like r to the number of edges. Um, OK, so by very, very general edge lengths, we mean a very general subset of, of the space. Um, right, and the the proof of this uh, second theorem, the general case, um, breaks down into essentially these uh, two steps. So first, we can translate the torsion condition of a difference of two to a difference of two points into a condition on studying the unit potential function. So if we if we take two points on our graph, the unit potential function is some piecewise linear function which has a special property about its, um, it could be defined in terms of a property on its Laplacian, but a, uh, a nice physical interpretation for this is, it just says if we input current at X and output at Y, um, where does the, what's the induced um, voltage electric potential on, on the graph? Um, so, um, right, so there's a straightforward way to connect this function to the torsion condition on the, the divisor we started with. And moreover, there's a convenient expression of the slopes of this potential function due to Kirchhoff. So um, from a long time ago, Kirchhoff studied such functions and showed that each slope of this potential function can be written as a ratio of um, polynomials, as a polynomials in the edge lengths of the graph. Um, and moreover, these polynomials all have um, positive integer coefficients um, or I guess not necessarily positive, but integer coefficients, they have some nice combinatorial interpretations. And um, therefore, by combining these two things, if we want all these points to be non-torsion, we essentially come down to um, 
some finite collection of polynomials needing to be irrational. Um, so that tells us that we're left with a very general subset. Um, so some details here that I left out, um, utterly steps, is that when we take x and y, x and y are allowed to vary within an edge as well. So we somehow have to account for, um, so Kirchhoff's laws give you polynomials when you fix the edge set, but as we vary x and y in between edges, we, we're kind of creating new edge sets as we do that. So there, there is some technical, key te technical details involved in into um, translating that extra choice of variability. Um, okay, yeah, I guess any, any questions up to this point? Can you give a uniform bound on uh, the number of torsion points for very general edge lengths? Oh, right. So, so in this very general edge lengths, the, the uniform bound we have is always, it's still 3g minus 3. Um, because so, so very general edge lengths and this by connected implies finitely many torsion points. And, but we also know in any case, there's finitely many torsion points, we, we end up with this uniform bound in the tropical case. Um, does that answer your question? Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, right, so I think in the remaining um, few minutes, um, I think I, there's one additional generalization to, to this result, which is to look at the, there's this higher degree case as well, we could study. Um, so beyond just looking at embedding a single copy of the curve in the Jacobian, we could embed a product of curves into the Jacobian as well, just by essentially add, adding the image, add, adding the images together because we have some addition operation here. Um, so in this case, we just, we take a tuple of D points on our metric graph, then we can add them together. And then to get a degree zero divisor, we just have to subtract off some fixed um, divisor as well. So to define this embedding, we're now fixing a um, degree, degree D divisor on our curve. Um, okay, so the image of such a map is also some nice a common foil object, it's um, piecewise polyhedral. And we could, again, ask how, how does it intersect the set of torsion points um, and will this intersection be finite or not? Um, so it turns out there's, um, okay, one, one thing we could say in the conditional case. So if, if the set is finite, then we can again have some nice uniform bound on it. So the uniform bound will just be, um, so by, by this kind of break divisive theory, each divisor could be separated into um, a choice of D distinct edges. And each, each of these cells has, has the most one piece. So we, we get a nice um, bound right away. Um, and, and there's also some analogous theorem for the, for the general case. So the general case though is, is somewhat more complicated though in the higher degree case, because we have to introduce this additional um, invariant, a graph invariant called the independent curve. Um, but the independent growth will essentially tell you when it is or is not finite. So in one case, if um, the degree is larger than independent growth, um, the number of torsion points will be infinite um, as a guarantee. Um, but in the other case, if the degree is strictly smaller than the independent growth, um, we can play the same game of choosing a very general subset and uh, right, for a very general choice of edge lengths, we, we get that this set will have to be finite on our metric graph. Um, and to connect this back to the degree one case, so the degree one case um, that was addressed on the previous slide, um, I guess we, we want the independent growth to be two or more. And that actually translates to having, we could have multiple biconnected components, but each biconnected component would have to have genus two. Um, so that's, um, I guess it doesn't translate exactly to the same theorem from the previous slide, but a, um, I guess a slightly more general um, theorem allowing graphs with multiple back connected components. Um, um, right, and, and so the last thing is just, I, I'll define what the independent growth is and it comes down to a sort of matroidal condition. So the girth of a graph 
Um, so by girth, I just mean the, the length of the smallest cycle in a graph. So if you consider the set of all cycles, we're just counting how many edges are in each cycle and taking, taking the smallest number that shows up. So to get our independent girth, we just modify this count um, to something a bit more refined than just the number of edges. Um, so one way of saying what we're counting is um, the rank of the co-graphic matroid. Um, so that's, I guess, if you're familiar with matroid theory, probably the more direct thing to say. But uh, even, um, so, so a non-matroidal definition is we're just um, taking, what we're counting is counting the number of edges and then correcting it by this factor, where this is, um, this H0 says the number of connected components that result when we delete the edges in A from our graph. Um, okay, so this, so the number of connected components is going to be at least one because our graph is non-empty. So this correction factor is going to be at least uh, zero. Okay, so because we're, or sorry, it's going to be at most um, zero. I guess we could be subtracting something larger. So the independent girth will satisfy a bound that it's, it's bounded above by the girth, but it could be strictly smaller. Um, right, so, so this, is, this is some, I guess, definition that sort of popped up naturally from studying this um, higher degree main and Mumford condition. And one, one thing I'm curious about um, if, if anyone has suggestions is, is to know where, where has it been studied before? Because I, um, I, I tried searching the literature a bit. Um, it, it seems like it, it'd be sort of independent uh, independently interesting as a combinatorial thing to study, um, but I, I wasn't able to find um, very much. Um, yeah, so, so if this is something you have seen before somewhere, I'd be very curious to, to hear more about um, what things it's connect, connected to and what else might motivate this kind of um, graph invariant. Uh, okay, so, so yeah, this concludes though, the things I wanna talk about. Thank, thank you all for your attention.